Hey guys, welcome back to another breakdown video. Tonight we're going to be covering episode 7, and this was by far my favorite episode of Andor. I'm really starting to feel like this is very, very developed now, and I don't know if that's because of all the slower episodes that came before, or because the story is now really starting to pick up and dive deep into the Star Wars mythos and lore. I first want to give a big shout out to all of you listening on Spotify right now. You guys have been doing a great job and enjoying the podcasts. I'm really happy about it. And a big shout out to everyone at the watch party last night on YouTube. So, man, what an awesome episode. While the show was slow, I feel things are really paying off. And the level of focus on how the Empire will deal with this act of theft is something that is really interesting to me. And of course, this act of theft is really the beginning of the rebellion. I'm really digging it. I think seeing this side of the Empire is something that I'd really want to dive into and learn more about. How are they going to deal with this? And it seems like they're very aggressive, and namely because of the fact that Yularen himself spoke with Palpatine. So we got a lot to talk about. Let's get right into it. So here we go. We start off with Cyril, and he's looking kind of depressed, gazing out the window again on Hosnian Prime. As he gets called by his mother and makes a bowl of space cereal with blue milk, and nothing's really changed. She's just chewing him out, really dogging him. He has his clothing tailored, he says, for his interview with his uncle's new job, and he overhears the theft on TV that Cassian led against the Empire. And Cyril starts to realize and think that Cassian was the one behind this. It's still tough to distinct whether Cyril is going to be for the Rebellion or work for the Empire. The ISB, the Imperial Security Bureau, holds a meeting and there is someone speaking. Now this is a very big character for those who are new to Star Wars. This is Admiral Yularen from the Clone Wars, now Colonel Yularen, who yes, did fight for both sides. So during the Clone Wars, he was Admiral Yularen and he fought against the Confederacy of Independent Systems. We saw him in the Clone Wars and he worked alongside Anakin Skywalker. He later, of course, as we see now, joined the Empire as Colonel and worked very closely alongside Grand Admiral Thrawn. He later passed with Governor Tarkin and everyone else on the first Death Star when it blew up during the Battle of Yavin in Episode 4. Yularen threatens and says that five times the amount stolen from Aldani, so the 80 million credits, will be levied on a planet harboring the rebels, and that any kind of rebel activity will receive the full power of the Emperor's fist. He spoke with Palpatine last night, who is now fully aware of this insurgence and initial rebellion. He has given the ISB full power and authority to act on this matter and shut down the activists and anyone else who should follow suit. He says no one in this room should have trouble accessing army or navy resources in the future. This means Palpatine has really given them full power to do what they want in bringing down these rebels. So while Palpatine is busy, he is pissed that this has happened. It looks sloppy to him, the Empire looks like a joke now, and it creates an opening of hope for those willing to do the same. The Emperor will also hold an emergency Senate meeting that will basically give the ISB full authority to do as they please in seizing anyone they think might be involved in what just happened on Aldani. Luthen listens on his radio and gets intel that the Empire is actually freaking out regarding what just happened, and he loves it. Mon Mothma visits him at his shop, and they continue to play dumb as if she's wanting to purchase more gifts for her husband as the driver stays outside. Now they do this because the driver is a hired spy, as we learn later, working with the Grand Vizier, or working for the Grand Vizier. Now the Grand Vizier is Mass Amida, he is Palpatine's right hand man during the prequels, and now well into the days of the Empire. He's also a lot in the comics and everything, so that he's very prominent. We actually see him leaving Palpatine's office when Yoda enters to kick Palpatine's butt, and then of course, you know, kind of lose. Mon Mothma can't believe that Luthen was behind the theft, but he sets her straight and tells her that this was needed. At 9.01, around there, we can see what looks like the Jedi Temple Guard's helmet. However, I can't really be too sure with how blurred it is, but we do see Plo Koon's rebreather mask, which serves as a rebreather for anyone of the Keldor species. I did cover all these in the original breakdown for the first three episodes. However, I can split that off and make that into its own episode if you so wish. Mon Mothma says Palpatine won't hesitate now, and we can see her fear in his power. As Luthen tells her, this is exactly what we need, that the Empire needs to overreact over this, and in doing so, the people will rise 
rise up and push back even more. He says the empire has been squeezing them so slowly that people are starting to not even notice. So she takes off and Coruscant is looking as beautiful as ever. Cyril joins his new job, the Bureau of Standards. Now this is a place that focuses on the measurements of numbers and time and just kind of file keeps everything. A lot of boring work it seems to me, but it also seems like they are pretty powerful as Cyril tells his boss or the manager here what he got fired for from Primo which was the kind of security mall cop kind of job that he had before. And the boss says that he could wipe his record a bit and clean it up. So clearly they have some authority. Luthen's assistant meets up with Vel and they discuss what needs to be done regarding Cassian, that he needs to be found and terminated. They don't want loose ends and to eliminate any trail back to Luthen and the rest. They need to get rid of him should he ever be captured by the Empire. So this is quite interesting since they're now going to headhunt Cassian down. But as we know, with how the episode ended, he's in jail now. To which I ask the question, of course, how does he get out? But even bigger than that, who does he meet in prison? And who does it lead him to? So Cassian has the Empire on him, and now Luthen's people on him too. We see Cinta is alive as well, as she uncovers a speeder bike and observes a massive Imperial Star Destroyer gliding overhead. So they're now on Aldani and ready to crack down, and they're investigating all Imperial workers and interrogating them, trying to find any spies, any leads, any rats. Cassian goes back home to Ferex and tries to convince his mother Marva to leave with him, as he now has enough money from the heist to survive and get them out of there. She originally agrees, but of course we see that she's going to change her mind, and it leads to a very emotional scene with clone troopers. Mon Mothma rubs elbows at this party, and she meets an old friend at this political sort of gathering, which includes Imperials as well. She meets with Tay. Now this is an old school friend from when they were kids. She tries to tell him about what she's been up to and that she needs money and for him to join her. That the Empire sees her as a nuisance but nothing more really, and that they don't as of yet have a clue what she's up to. Now of course she's referring to the rise of the rebellion that she's creating, which Tay has no idea about, and she doesn't really get to finish telling him as her husband interrupts. She says something I really liked. It was something along the lines of, focus on the stone in my hand and you miss the knife that I put to your throat. This is really awesome. She's very focused on being an annoying fly in the Senate, and she's fine with that. But that's not a real threat. She wants to pretend to start a Chandrillan charity program, which will require meetings. To the Empire, it'll look like just a charity or nothing. But to her, and whoever else is going to be joining, it'll obviously be about the rebellion. Her husband arrives and she tells Tay not to tell him that he can't be trusted. This I also really liked because it really drives home the fact that the Empire has people, eyes and ears literally everywhere, including spouses who will betray you. We await an answer on whether or not he's in to join her on this mysterious ask, but I'm sure that he'll give in and trust his old friend later on. I kind of have a bad feeling that he's probably going to be killed, but we'll see what happens. Cassian visits his ex-girlfriend Bix, and she isn't too happy to see him. He pays his 12k debt to her, and he leaves on a bit of a cold note, and they kind of just go their separate ways. She seems sad about it, but not sad enough to stop him. As he walks through the town, he sees stormtroopers and gets a flashback of the clone troopers 13 years ago. How they were marching through the town and having stones thrown at them by the villagers. This was when Cassian's dad, Clem, is trying to stop it as the clones turn around on orders and aim at him and the others throwing stones. We, in another flashback, see him hanging there. So clearly the Empire made an example of this type of behavior. They're cutthroat, they're evil, they're very hardcore. And this was to let the village people see this daily, that this is what happens if you don't obey the Empire. It was very hard for Marva to see this, and of course for Cassian to see his dad like this. This is post Revenge of the Sith, this is about two years after Revenge of the Sith, if this is 13 years ago, and Cassian Andor takes place five years before Episode 4. This is obviously after Order 66 has controlled the minds of the clone troopers, we can see that, and they are still here at this point, because the Empire is still using clone troopers before they switch over to a broader, less tactile, less trained version called Imperial Stormtroopers. We see just how militant clones have become, which is much like in that scene during Attack of the Clones, before the Clone Wars show came out and kind of humanized them. Marva decides 
to stay. She says the rebellion has brought her hope and that she's not afraid anymore. She gives a powerful speech of how she had avoided the square for 13 years where Clem was hung. This means the scene with the clones happened two years after Revenge of the Sith. We see a flashback of Cassian as a teenager angrily trying to take on clone troopers with a baton as they raise their blasters on him. This is the last of the flashback we get and the outcome of this scenario is unknown as of this time, but I'm hoping that we get to see more as the episodes continue. Marva says that she can't beat them if she runs away, and this is a great line. It makes me think of Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, and how him running away just was even more of a mistake from a writing perspective, and just not like Luke. Marva decides to stay, and Cassian decides to leave. She tells him to stop searching for his sister, that there were no survivors on Canari, and that he shouldn't blame himself for her death or for what happened with the attack on his village. If they didn't kidnap him, he'd have been dead along with his people. Now, are they actually dead or is she just saying this? I guess we'll find out. Blevin grills and calls out Dedra publicly at the table at the ISB, where she promises to provide hard evidence and facts regarding her thesis that the rebels were on Ferex, and they are actually stealing a lot of high-level Imperial equipment to form some sort of a rebellion. Partisan promotes Daedra to the case finally and sees that her passion for finding these rebels is quite evident, finally giving her the chance that she wanted and this of course rubs it in Blevin's face who sort of gets demoted on the task, which was great. Partigaz mentions Ord Mantell, and now Ord Mantell, I'll, I'll briefly say, was the home base for the Shadow Collective, which was Darth Maul's gang. There was a massive battle against the CIS, Count Dooku, Grievous, Palpatine, they were all involved in the Son of Dathomir comic run, which covered Maul's story right after Season 5 of The Clone Wars, where he was captured by Palpatine after their epic lightsaber fight in Season 5 with Savage Press and Maul versus Palpatine, to which of course Savage Press was killed by the Emperor. Andor is on a tropical paradise, Miami style. This place is called Neomos, and he seems to have found a girlfriend or a friend who calls him Keef. So he's clearly using a new name or an alias to hide from the Empire, and of course Luthen as he grabs some credits out of his secured box. He heads to get some groceries and snacks where he sees some people running away from sand troopers of the Empire. He starts to feel a little paranoid and jogs a bit out of there because he doesn't want to be seen. And this is what gets him taken by the Empire as they try to brand him as part of the runners who did whatever they did to get captured. And of course we see some K2SO droids running after them. He's choked out by one of the droids where we see Cassian next in court and he's sentenced to six years for anti-imperial speech and vandalism. Cyril scans his computer hard at work and we get the end of the episode. So by far this was my favorite episode. I really love the music, the tone, the pacing. I think it was really cool and of course the nods to all of the different characters. Yularen showing up, Emperor Palpatine was name dropped so many times and everyone's fearful of him, everyone is aware of him. The Grand Vizier, Mass Amida, Cassian's sister was mentioned, and of course we got to see Bix again, who he told if she ever sees Luthen again to tell him just to forget about him. So clearly he's worried that Luthen is going to come after him. Now I think Cyril will work with Cassian and be part of the rebellion soon. He's kind of turning out to be like a good guy. He's humanized a lot, you know, and with his mother and all of those scenes. So I don't think that they would make him an evil doer or a part of the empire or anything like that. I think he's going to be a good guy or he's going to help Cassian in some sort of way. Maybe he's going to wipe Cassian's slate clean. I don't really know what, what's going to happen, but he's obviously in this place of power where he can now do a lot of good for the Rebellion by wiping records or changing things up. I think Cassian will meet someone important in jail and this will lead him to Saw Gerrera, which will form now, seriously, the Rebellion. I'm still curious as to how Luthen knows so much about Cassian. I think the show answered a lot of questions, but also raised a ton of questions and left us on the edges of our seats for episode eight, which comes out next week. Now, next week, I'm going to be doing a watch party for Tales of the Jedi, which will be six episodes all dropping at once. I'm very stoked for this. Very, very excited for it. Now, I think I will probably do a watch party for 
Cassie and Andor afterwards because I have to get the breakdown up. So if you guys want, you can watch that with me. Otherwise, I will be doing the Tales of the Jedi video first, and then we'll be doing the watch party for Andor Episode 8 right after. Thanks so much for watching this breakdown video. Let me know if there's anything that I missed. Please leave a like if you did enjoy it. I love doing these breakdowns, and a lot of time and effort goes into them to get them up just a few hours after the episode drops. Please do check me out on Spotify for daily podcasts, and I will see you all in the next episode on Star Wars Theory. Until then, my fellow Jedi and Sith friends, remember, the Force will be with you always. Always.